2022 Grade 9 Pascal Math Contest, questions 21 through 25. A 5x5 five five pegboard and a 10x10 10 10 pegboard each have holes at the intersection of invisible horizontal and vertical lines that occur in 1 centimeter intervals from each edge. Pegs are placed into the holes on the two main diagonals of both pegboards. The 5x5 five five centimeter pegboard is shown. It has 16 holes. 8 shaded holes have pegs and the 8 unshaded holes do not. How many empty holes? does the 10 by 10 pegboard have? Okay, so this question, it took me a while to figure out what are they talking about? Are the, the two pegboards overlapping? Are they on top of each other? I have no clue. So then I read it carefully, and they're just giving you an example of a 5x5, five five, which is here. And they're explaining how it's being created. These holes are being created. And then they're saying if you apply the same principle to the 10 by 10, how many empty holes would they be? So basically what they're saying is this is a 5x5, five five, right? So this is 1 centimeter, 2 centimeter, 3 centimeter, 4 centimeter, 5 centimeter. And in 1 centimeter intervals from the edge, they've got these holes. So this is the edge. There's the first hole. And then another hole 1 centimeter later, and so on. And that's how they made these holes. There's 16 of them. And then... They're saying that the holes in the diagonals, um, those ones are going to be shaded, right? Yeah. The, the pegs are placed. So if pegs are placed, they're shaded. So that diagonal and diagonal, diagonal and when you count it up, it's uh, eight. And therefore, the unshaded holes, because the, the shaded holes have pegs, and the unshaded holes do not have pegs. And in this case, it's eight unshaded holes. So they just that's just an explanation of how this process works. They're saying, do the exact same process, but this time with a 10 by 10 centimeter pegboard. Okay, I think I can do that. So let's make a 10 by 10. And let's try to uh, illustrate what's going on. So this is a 10 by 10, right? So we have to, one centimeter from the edge, start making these holes. So this is... I mean, I, I don't think this is going to be very much uh, drawn to scale. Uh, but what's important is, if you notice, like, if here it was one, uh, let's say, let's say this is marker zero, then this is one centimeter, two centimeter, three centimeter, four centimeter, five centimeter, right? So same thing, this is marker zero, this would be uh, uh, ten centimeters this time, right? So let's see if I can do this. One, two... 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, like that, right? So, same thing on the other side. It would be the same kind of process. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Oops, that's not really drawn to scale. <laughs> so, let's, let's make this a little bit more s to scale. 2, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. So the holes would go here, here, here. You got it? The one centimeter from the edge. And similarly, all the way down like that. Okay. So it looks to me like there's nine and nine. Yeah, nine by nine. So nine by nine. There's me. That's 81 total holes in this 10 by 10. Okay, so then now we have to figure out how many of those 81 are uh, shaded. Now the shaded are the diagonals. Now this question is just a little tricky, not extremely tricky, but just a little. In that, unlike the previous example, this example actually has one that's an overlap. See here. There's no overlap. There's four and there's four separate ones. But here, there's going to be one in the middle, like that. So when you actually draw this, all right, it's going to have one in the middle that's sort of 
uh, an overlap uh, of, let's see if I can take, first draw it in, and then you'll be able to get an understanding. There you go. So, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, yeah, there you go. So, as you can see, this is the diagonal, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is the diagonal, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. But it's not 9 plus 9. It's 9 plus 9 minus 1 because this one is common to both. So it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Yeah, 17. And therefore, uh, the total is 81. 17 are shaded. They have pegs inside. And they wanted... Uh, empty holes. So the empty ones, the unshaded, would be 81 minus 17, which is 64. And if you notice, there's no answer choices because starting in 2022, the CEMC, um, they decided to change sort of the way they do things and that instead of having answer choices for questions 21 through 25, you would have to essentially get the answer and just fill that in. So the answer in this case is 64. What is the integer formed by the rightmost two digits of the integer equal to 4 to the power of 127, 5 to the power of 129, and 7 to the power of 131? Okay. So these kinds of questions are very important, very good on uh, math contests because they may seem you know, daunting or impossible, but you have to look for a pattern, and I will explain. So first, let's start with 4 to the power of 127. Let's go through powers of 4. And usually, you don't have to go through too many. But uh, usually, 4 or 8 is enough. But I'm going to go a little bit more. Uh, let's, go, let's go up to a little 10. Actually, a little bit more than 10 and see if there's a pattern. And if there is we are going to be benefiting from that pattern. We can extrapolate that pattern all the way up to 4 to the power of 127. Okay, here we go. So 4 to the power of 1 is 4. I'm going to write 0, 4. Uh, this is obviously 16. This is 64. And you guys are allowed to use calculators on the Canadian math contest, so you can just put this in your calculator. Just keep multiplying by 4. 4 times 4 times 4 like that. 1, 0, 2, 4, and so on, right? And then now, um, you have to see, is there a pattern? Well, is there? There is. 4, 6, 4, 6, 4, 6. But here's the thing. This question is asking about the last two digits, not just the last one digit. So I'm trying to see, is there a pattern with the last two digits? And so far, I do not see a pattern with the last two digits. I see a pattern with the last one digit that's fairly easy and quick to figure out. The last two digits, not yet. So I'm going to keep going and see if anything starts to repeat. Any kind of pattern, I should say. Uh, nothing yet. Even up to 4 to the power of 10, I don't see anything. But once I get to 4 to the power of 11, you'll see. I'm just going to write the last two digits because these numbers are getting very big a pattern starts to appear. And I hope you see it. There you go. Just like how you had here, 0, 4, 16, 64, you start getting the same pattern. Okay? So that means we can extrapolate this dot, dot, dot all the way to 4 to the power of 127. It repeats every 10 uh, with regard to the last two digits. So. 4 to the power of 127 would essentially behave as 4 to the power of 7, which is this guy, and the last two digits would therefore be 84. Okay, so that is how you do these kinds of questions. But we're still not done. We can still got this one. 5 to the power of 129. Okay, 5 to the power of 129. Uh, this one, fortunately, is easy. 
because 5 to the power of something is always going to be ending with 5. And the last two digits actually are always going to be 25. And you, you figure that out very quickly. So if you extrapolate this all the way down to all the way up to 5 to the power of 129, the last two digits are going to be 25. So that was an easy one. Okay, good. Then we got this 7 to the power of 131. Okay, let's see what we get here. Let's 7 to the power of 1, 7 to the power of 2, so on. Uh, let's see if there's any pattern. And again, we're not looking at just the um, last one digit. We're looking at the last two digits. So this is 07. This is 49. 3, 43. 2, 4, 0, 1. And then I'm going to just write the last two digits of these guys. And when I do, you will clearly see that there is a pattern. It, it repeats every four. So that's a little bit easier. So if it repeats every four, you can extrapolate this. 7 to the power of 128. It, it seems like every multiple of four is 0, 1. So that's going to be 0, 1. And therefore, 7 to the power of 131 would be uh, 43. Yeah, 43. Well, the last two digits. Well, there you go. We got it. This equation, therefore, the last two digits of 4 to the power of 127 is 84. The last two digits of 5 to the power of 129 is 25. And the last two digits of 7 to the power of 131 is 43. If you add those numbers up, you get 152. And they want you to find the rightmost two digits of that. And the rightmost two digits are 52. So 52 is the answer to this question. In the diagram, two circles are centered at O. The smaller circle has a radius of 1, and the larger circle has a radius of 3. Points P and Q are placed on the larger circle so that the areas of the two shaded regions are equal. If angle POQ is x, what is the value of x? Okay, so before I start in the question, I'll just give you a very basic introduction to how you would solve such questions by giving an example. So let's say I have a circle, and this is the center let's, of that center circle. And I say, calculate the area of that shaded, that pi region. And I tell you that this angle in here, um, well, whatever you want it to be, let's say it's uh, 30 degrees. Well, how would you do that? Well, you take 30 degrees and divide by 360, because 360 is the total angle all the way around a circle. And you multiply that by pi r squared. And of course, you would need to know the, the radius of the circle. Let's say the radius is 2. So 3 over 360 is what? Uh, what was that? 1 over 12, I think. Yeah, 1 over 12. Pi 2 squared. So that looks like 4 over 12 pi, which is pi over 3. So the area of that little pi segment well, pi pie, not pi pi, is pi over, uh, pi over 3. So same thing over here. It's a little bit more complicated, but same principle. So we have to come up with an equation for these shaded regions. The equation is as, is as follows. It would be pi r squared for the smaller circle. And this angle is x, right? So... In this case, we don't want x. We want the other, the complement of x, which would be 360 minus x over 360. And that would give you the area of that shaded region, this part here. Okay. And then they are saying that the sh two shaded regions are equal. So that region is equal to this region, okay? So we've got to put the equal sign and then figure out a formula for that other region 
and maybe it's a good idea for me to use a different color in that region. The, shoot, the two shaded regions are equal. Okay, so let's figure out a formula for that one. That one is going to be um, pi r squared times x over 360 minus that little, the pi that's not shaded, which is pi small r squared times x over 360. And I believe that is the equation. So let me just double check here. Pi small r squared, 360 minus x over 360. Pi big r squared, x over 360 minus pi small r squared, x over 360. Yeah, okay. Well, good news here is a lot of things cancel. The pi's all cancel. The small r is 1 squared. 360 minus x. Oh, I think the 360 is also canceled because there's a 360 in everything. Okay, great. Uh, big R is 3 squared, and then there's just x, and then small r is 1 squared, and then there's just x. Yeah, I think that's it. So hopefully I have not made any mistakes. So 360 minus x is equal to 9x minus x, and this looks like 360 is equal to 9x, and therefore x is 360 divided by 9, which is 40. So the answer to this question is 40 degrees. A pretty number is a seven-digit positive integer with the following properties. The integer formed by its leftmost three digits is a perfect square. The integer formed by its rightmost four digits is a perfect cube. Its ten thousandths digit and the ones digit are equal. Its thousandths digit is not zero. How many pretty numbers are there? Okay. So we have this number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And they're saying that these three would become a perfect square. And these four would be a perfect cube. And then the 10,000th digit, so this guy and the ones digit are the same. So I'll just call those both A's. And the thousandth digit is not a zero. So that can't be a zero. Okay, I got it. All right, so we, I, think, I think we just have to do this manually. I really don't see any kind of formula. Okay, so first let's just concentrate on the n-squared guy, this guy. It's obviously a three-digit number. So how many three-digit perfect squares are there? There's 10 squared, 11 squared, uh, 12 squared, and so on, right? Uh... And we're going up to a three-digit number, so it has to be less than a thousand. So I think we're gonna go up to what? What is it? Uh, Thirty squared is nine hundred. I think thirty-one squared is nine sixty-one, and thirty-two squared is over a thousand. Yeah, it's one thousand twenty-four. Okay, so we're gonna go up to thirty-one. So thirteen. Wait, hold on. Squared, not cubed. I gotta make sure I do it right. Okay, so let me write them all out all the way up to 31 squared and come back and we'll talk about it. Well, there you go. There is all the ones between 100 and 961. So basically three digit numbers that are perfect squares. Okay, that uh, takes care of this guy. Now we have to turn our attention to the cubes. And same kind of story. We have to figure out how many perfect cubes are there that are four digit numbers. So basically from a thousand to 10,000, right, or be less than 10,000. Well, the first one is 10 cubed, which is 1,000, and 11, 12, 13, you can use your calculator, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, I think 21 is the largest yeah, cube. Uh, nine two six one, and then it, because if you go up to twenty two cubed, it goes over ten thousand. Yeah. So fortunately, this list is a little bit smaller. So these are all the possible values for the perfect cube. 
You got it. So let me just fill out these guys. Okay. Well, we got all the, the ones. Now we turn our attention to a very important uh, matter. That's this one right here. That this digit has to be the same as that digit. And that is going to really allow us to figure out how this pretty number can be created. All right, so let's work with this. Let's say our n squared is 100. If our n squared is 100, then that means the m squared, or sorry, m cubed, has got to end in a 0 because it, that ends in a 0. So therefore, when you put that here, this a has to be the same as that a. Therefore, the last digit of the m cubed has to also end in 0. Well, how many zeros are there? There's that guy and that guy. So if my n squared is 100, I've got two possibilities for the m cubed. Does that make sense? All right. Let's move our attention to the next one. If n squared is 121, then the last digit is 1. And therefore, the last digit of the m uh, to the power of 3 also has to be 1. So that means this guy will work and this guy will work. So I've got two choices there. Okay. I'm not going to walk you through every single one. I'll just do one more. How about if my n squared is 144? Last digit is 4. And therefore, the last digit of the m cubed has to also be 4. And I think that's the only one. So I've only got one possible pretty number that can be created with that guy. And then similarly, you go down this list. And you basically get 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, um, 2, 2, 2, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2. And then add these up. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. 30 is the answer to the question, how many pretty numbers are there? A hexagonal prism has a height of 165. Its two hexagonal faces are regular hexagons with side length 30. Its other six faces are rectangles. A fly and an ant start at point X on the bottom face and travel to point Y on the top face. The fly flies directly along the shortest route through the prism. The ant crawls around the outside of the prism along a path of constant slope so that it winds around the prism exactly n plus a half times for some positive integer n. The distance crawled by the ant is more than 20 times, more than 20 times the distance flown by the fly. What is the smallest possible value of n? All right. First, I'm going to concentrate on the fly. Yeah, and then I'll concentrate on the ant. So the fly basically goes directly from x to y. So direct path like that. And therefore, I think we can just use the simple Pythagorean theorem to figure this out. I don't think there's any need to be any more complicated than that. And it would be just this Pythagoras of a right triangle. Yeah, I think that's it. Where this is the right triangle right there. That's the right angle. Right here. That's the right angle. Okay. So let me just draw out that triangle sort of, you know, in 2D. And here we go. So the distance, the height is 165. So that's 165. X is here. Y is here. And then I'll just call it that F for the distance that the fly has to travel. And then the the part this part here that I will need to figure out a little bit separately uh, that that's not immediately obvious. Okay, so I think I'm going to have to use the, the the fact that it's a hexagon. 
Yeah. Because essentially, you're going from here to here on a hexagon. So you're going like that. So I think I can get this with 30, 60, 90 triangle. I got it. Okay, so in a hexagon, you have essentially four triangles, right? So 4 times 180 is the total sum of all the angles. And when you divide that by the six internal angles, you will be able to get the value for each internal angle, and that's 120. And some of you already know that. You didn't even need to calculate it, but I just wanted to calculate it for you. So each of these internal angles, like this guy, for example, is 120. Now, if you're going to chop it in half, it will become 60 and 60 by making a right angle. And therefore, this is 30. This is 30. So you got this 30, 60, 90 triangle. And if you all remember, 30, 60, 90 triangles, this is 30, this is 60, and this is 90. The ratio of the sides is always 1, 2, and root 3. Right? So we are told that the side is 30 centimeters. So that means that this side here is 30 centimeters. So we can just use the ratio of the sides of a 30, 60, 90 triangle to figure out the other side. Fairly simple. This is 30. So that we can figure out that side. We'll just call it whatever you want to call it, A. So A over 30 is the equivalent of root 3 over 2. And therefore, A is equal to 15 root 3. All right? Fairly straightforward. And therefore, this whole since this is 15 root 3, this whole side is double that. So that whole side will be 30 root 3. And that side is therefore 30 root 3 also because it's the same. So in this triangle, this is 30. This side here is 30 root 3. And then we can easily calculate this diagonal. We'll call it D. So D squared is equal to 30 squared plus 30 root 3 squared. And when you solve, you get D is equal to 60. So that's what you put here. So all that big long song and dance to get that. Okay, now you just solve for F again using Pythagoras. F squared is 60 squared plus 165 squared. And this is going to be 15 root 137. So I'll let you do the math. I'm sure you guys can do that. Okay, so F is not so bad. The fly. Now we got to start talking about the ant. Ant is a little bit different. Ant is not that straightforward. It crawls around. Okay, let's look at this diagram. It crawls around the outside of the prism along a path of constant slope so that it winds around the prism exactly n plus a half times for some positive integer n. And then it's there saying that the distance that this ant crawls is more than 20 times. Okay, so let's call the distance the ant travels a, and it's more than 20 times. So it's not equal to, it's more than 20 times f. So A is greater than 20 times this, which is what, 300? Yeah, 300 root 137. Okay. All right, now i got to figure out how do I calculate what A is. I mean, F was fairly straightforward using Pythagoras. This wasn't so bad. But how do I figure out? Huh, okay. I think the way to do it is by opening it up. You know what I mean? Like opening up the diagram. Because basically what we're doing is you kind of go in like this, all the way around, and eventually, yeah, all the way around. Uh, okay, I got it, I got it, all right. You're going to open it up. And when you open it all up, you're going to have the base, and then you're going to have the path that the ant takes, which is represented by this diagonal, and then you're going to have the height, which is 165. So what I did was I just uh, drew the entire path from x to y, but not 
in a three-dimensional diagram, but in a two-dimensional diagram. And that's basically going to establish a Pythagorean relationship once again. Now they're telling us that the ant goes around n plus a half times. And each time we know it goes around, it will uh, cover a certain distance. And let me go back to the diagram to show you what that distance is. Every time it goes around, now watch carefully. When it goes around from there to there, that's 30. 30 again. When it comes back here, it has gone six sides, right? It's easier to show it up top. One, two, three, four, five, six times. Each is 30. So six times 30 is 180. So each time it goes around, it covers 180 uh, centimeters of the base. So that's what you put here, 180. And then it goes around n plus a half times. So that's why you multiply it by n plus a half. And I think a, well, a we have, we don't have the actual value. We just know that a is greater than 300 root 137. And I think that's it. Th th this will set it up for us. I think that's pretty much all we need to do, really, to set up another Pythagorean relationship. And then we concentrate on this formula. So that formula basically states that a is greater than 300 root 137. And a we can get from this triangle, it would essentially be the same as, uh, well, I'll just write it out here, 165 squared plus uh, 180n plus 90 squared is a squared, right? I if you wrote a Pythagorean relationship. So therefore, if we square both sides here, this is going to be a squared is greater than, uh, what is that? Uh, 300 squared times 137. So therefore, we can put this here. So that means 165 squared plus 180n plus 90 squared is greater than 300 squared times 137. Okay, I th that, that's pretty reasonable to solve. Okay, let's do this. I'm going to put this on the other side. So I'm going to keep this here for now because I don't want to expand that. So this is going to be, uh, well, whatever this is, 1, 2, 3, 3, 0, 0, 0, 0, minus 165 squared, which is 27, 2, 2, 5. And therefore, that's 1, 12, 3, 0, 2, 7, 7, 5 is 180n plus 90 all squared. Okay making some good progress here. And remember, you're allowed to use your calculator. So I will take the square root of both sides. So that's 1, 12, 3, 0, 2, sorry, 1, 2, 3, 0, 2, 7, 7, 5. Square root is 3, 5, 0, 7, point 5, 3 is 180 n plus 90. And then subtract 90 from that guy and divide by 180. And you should be able to get that n is greater than 18.98. Okay. We are almost done. They're saying what is the smallest possible value of n and knowing that n is a positive integer. So if n is a positive integer and n is greater than 18.98, that means n is either 19 or 20 and 21 and so on. The smallest possible value is 19. And that is the answer to this question.